means that something which is part of a total budget. So an element of a total budget in this case, we are looking at accommodation. Accommodation is an essential element of the total budget. Accommodation is an essential element of the total budget. So our correct answer, which we are going to circle, is answer A. Now, moving on to the next, uh, next question, which appears on the next page. The next question is 1.1.5, which reads, a safety precaution at an airport. So our key word there is at an airport when using e-hailing transport uh, companies such as Uber or Bolt. So which is uh, the most appropriate answer then? So it's not possible for you to get to know the drivers of the different companies, but what you can actually do is use a registered company's application or app to make the boat booking. So our correct answer will be B, which is to use a company's um, app to make the booking. So I'm going to circle the correct answer there, which is B. Now moving on to the next um, next question, which uh, reads, a reason why a tourist will visit the website of the Automobile Association of South Africa before traveling overseas. You know, obviously, that the Automobile Association of South Africa is responsible for issuing the international driver's permit. So in this case, uh, the letter, the our most appropriate answer will be uh, D, to apply for an IDP, which is also known as the International Driver's uh, Permit. Now, moving on to the next question, which is 1.1.7. The icons associated with the city of Moscow. So our keyword there, we need to highlight uh, the city of Moscow. We need to highlight the city of Moscow. If you look at um, the other options which are there, they are not actually Mos uh, Moscow. Uh, they are not places which are found in Moscow. The French Riviera, for example, is not found in Moscow, and the Eiffel Tower, they are found in France. Then the Big Ben and the Buckingham Palace, these two are found in the United Kingdom and specifically in um, London. Then the Alcaza of Segovia and the Algarve, these ones are not found in um, Mos in Moscow, rather. But the two appropriate will be the Kremlin and the Red Square. So in this particular case, the correct answer would be the Kremlin and the Red Square. This is the appropriate answer for that particular question. Then moving on to 1.1.8, the icon that is associated with the mass killing of people during the Second World War is located in, um, it is located in um, Poland. So Poland is on letter B. So the icon that is associated with the mass killing of the Jewish people in particular during the First World War, it is actually known as Poland. So Poland would be our most appropriate um, answer there. Moving on to the next one. Let's move on to the next uh, question, which is question 1.1.9. A positive uh, experience can lead to. Uh, this is one of the uh, characteristics of a successful attraction. So a positive tourist experience can lead to an attraction being successful. It actually leads to successful attractions. A positive uh, tourist ex experience would lead to successful um, attractions. Then 1.1.10, an important factor to consider for an attraction to be successful. So when you want uh, your attraction to be successful, you need to keep visitors safe from criminals. Because once uh, visitors uh, become victims of criminal behavior, they are not most likely going to return to their attraction. So uh, the most appropriate answer there will be uh, C. C will be our most appropriate answer. Then we go to 1.1.1. The Sunshine Golf Tour recently held in South Africa was sponsored by the South African uh, Tourism, which is SA Tourism. The type of marketing initiative shown in the picture will result in what? So you can see that this is actually um, a gentleman who is playing um, golf then um, we can also see the logo for South Africa tourism, then and also for Limpopo pro, uh, tourism. So it is uh, they're actually promoting the tourism of South Africa in general 
and also of Limpopo province in particular. So what would this result in? So this would actually promote South Africa as a leading sports. Uh, it's actually a positive thing. It would promote South Africa as a leading sports destination. So our correct answer would be B. Then moving on to the next one, 1.1 point at uh, Official funding of tourism initiatives for South Africa tourism is provided by. So let's eliminate the wrong answer step. A, you wouldn't be uh, appropriate the tourism grading council of South Africa is not correct. Then the South African Heritage uh, Resource Agency is not correct. Then uh, SATSA is not correct. So the correct answer would be D, which actually can be uh, written in full as the Tourism Business Council of South Africa. It is responsible for collecting um, money for marketing initiatives. Then going on to the next uh, question, 1.1.3. The national anthem of the Republic of South Africa, it represents, it is made up of so many languages. So it um, actually represents the diversity. Diversity is the abundance of um, people from different um, cultural backgrounds and languages in uh, at a particular time. Then 1.1.4, it talks about the contract of employment stipulates that uh, the following. So we have uh, working hours and professional uh, integrity in the workplace. Then we also have this one, code duties, fringe benefits, and uniform uh, allowances. Then conduct of the staff at um, the workplace, then travel benefits, um, and also uh, work duties. So in this case, uh, we can talk about uh, B, simply because um, A would be eliminated. Yes, um, working hours is correct. Professional integrity, yes, uh, that one is much more held by uh, or discussed in the code of what? Of contact. So um, the code duties, fringe benefits, and uniform allowances. So our correct answer in this case will be option B. Option B will be our correct answer in this case. Then 1.1.5. A well-groomed employee, someone who is well-groomed, um, actually, um, if you look at A, where is clothing with offensive um, uh, uh, slogans? This is inappropriate. So this one we are canceling out, out. uses uh, perfume with an overwhelming scent is also inappropriate. Where is clean and neatly ironed uniform? Yes, this is actually acceptable. So a well-groomed um, employee wears clean and neatly ironed uniform. Then going to 1.1.16, the economic pillar of sustainability, the economic pillar of sustainability uh, refers to the, when you look at the economic pillar, we are talking about uh, the profit, it's also known as the profit uh, pillar. So it refers to ownership and participation of the local community. So a tourism business should make sure that they uh, also um, incorporate um, the locals in the ownership structures of their business. So that is part of the economic pillar of sustainability. Then 1.1.7, the Tour de France is an international, um, it's not a ultra marathon, but actually it is a cycle race. It is a cycle race which actually takes place annually on a yearly basis. Then 1.1.18, this South African city hosted the 2023 Netball Cup. So that city is actually Cape Town. The 2023 uh, Netball World Cup was hosted in Cape Town, South Africa. Then going to 1.1.19. Hurricane Freddy damaged infrastructure in Malawi, Mozambique in February 2023. So the hurricane can be classified or was classified as a natural disaster. A hurricane is actually a natural disaster. It actually emanates from um, natural conditions. So it's a natural uh, disaster. Statistics South Africa stress essay gathers information on the number of bed nights for tourists. This information uh, refers to the average. Uh, so this is just uh, the average of the length of stay at an accommodation establishment or its accommodation establishment. So that is um, the multiple choice questions. 
Now we move on to 1.2. 1.2, it actually reads, give one word or term for each of the following descriptions by choosing a word or term from the list which is below. Write only the word next to the question numbers. So we are only going to write um, the word next to the question number in the answer book. So we will write them right next to the statement. So the first question is 1.2.1. The zero degree line of latitude from which all countries read um, their time. So all, all times for all countries are based on the UTC. So we are going to take the UTC. We are going to take uh, the UTC, uh, the UTC, which is known as the universal, known as the universal uh, time coordinate. known as the universal time coordinate, which is abbreviated as UTC. So we have taken that one. Then 1.2.2, 1 .2, international uh, customs regulations determine that firearms taken onto an aircraft are actually part of prohibited goods. So you are not, pro you are not allowed to uh, take firearms. Firearms, we are talking about guns, and rifles, prohibited uh, goods. This is done for safety uh, reasons. You are not allowed to carry firearms or weapons on an aircraft because it might result in terrorism or it might result in hijacking of the what of uh, the flight. Then important information included in a tourist uh, passport. Let's look at our options there. So um, the best possible option then is the expired date. Uh, whenever you take a passport, it actually shows you the expired date. Usually, a passport is only valid for a duration of uh, 10 years. So, the correct answer there will be the expiry date. Expiry date is important information which you find uh, on a passport. Then, a condition caused by the long distance um, air travel across. Um, many time zones. So when you approach this question, it is important for you to highlight uh, the key thing there so that you won't uh, be confused. So when you travel across many time zones, you are most likely going to be jet lagged. So we have two options here. There's jet fatigue and there's jet lag. But our appropriate, uh, our appropriate answer will be jet lag. Jet lag, you get it when you cross several time zones when a passenger flies again um, across several time zones they are most likely to get a condition which is known as uh, jet lag whereby they cannot figure out their time the actual time of uh, where they are the common currency used in many european countries so many european countries have uh, decided to adopt the euro as their, their standard uh, currency so um, the euro is the common currency which is used by many European countries. The euro is the name of um, the currency. Now, moving on to the next question, which is question 1.3. 1.3, it reads, uh, choose the correct words from those given in the brackets. Write only the words next to them. Uh, question uh, number in the answer book. So in this case, we are going to be highlighting the correct um, the correct uh, words from the two options which are given. So in the first case, we have um, the first question, which is actually uh, the first question, which reads the WHO, uh, the WHS or the WHO is responsible for regulating health issues uh, globally. So the correct answer there is the W. H O the W H O is our correct answer. So um, it is actually known as the what the World Health Organization, World Health uh, Organization W H O is the one which is responsible for um, monitoring uh, health um, issues. It is the one which is responsible for monitoring health 
related uh, issues. So that's the correct answer, W, H, O. Now moving on to them. Uh, so the correct answer is the one which is highlighted uh, there. Moving on to uh, the next question. Uh, yellow fever or diarrhea is considered a high risk uh, disease for people traveling through uh, affected uh, areas. All right. So, um, I think you should know very well that yellow fever, it is actually a disease which is uh, prevalent in certain countries, especially here in Africa, it is um, prevalent in Central and West Africa. So for tourists who are traveling there, they should um, actually take health uh, precautions because they are not immune uh, to it. So they should take health uh, preventative medicine before they go to that area. So the correct answer there, it will be yellow fever. Then moving on to the next question, uh, preventative medication for uh, for malaria or bilazia should be taken before visiting affected uh, regions. When you visit malaria, um, uh, places which are actually uh, known for malaria, in the case of uh, South Africa, we have provinces like Limpopo and Pumalanga. They are well known for being um, uh, for for being malaria risk areas. So when you visit such places, you should take uh, preventative medication. So the correct answer in this scenario. It is uh, malaria. Malaria will be our correct uh, option there. Malaria will be the correct, correct uh, option. Then moving on to 1.3.4. Uh, travel clinics or travel agencies offer vaccinations to tourists when traveling abroad. So that is, it is the responsibility of travel clinics to offer vaccinations. It is the responsibility of um, travel uh, clinics to offer vaccinations for people who are traveling abroad. So they also offer tra uh, health advice to people who will be traveling abroad. Then 1.1.5, uh, 1.3.5, the global pandemic known as the COVID-19 or Zika virus brought the global tourism industry to a halt. So the global pandemic was actually COVID-19. So the reason why we are choosing COVID-19, it affected the whole world. Yes, we know about the Zika virus, but the Zika virus mainly affected Brazil. But COVID-19, it actually brought the whole world to a standstill. So that's why we are choosing the COVID-19 uh, option there. Then moving to 1.1.4, we actually have the table, which is there. And let's go through the table. It says, choose a sustainable tourism concept. So it is mainly focused on sustainable tourism. It is focused on the topic sustainable tourism. So we have on column A, a tourism business investing money in a local old age home. So for this one, the correct answer will be G. It will be G, which is CSI. So I am going to write uh, the correct answer uh, next uh, to uh, to the first M. Um, so that is actually C S I. Then the correct uh, letter will be the letter G. So C S I, um, it actually stands for uh, corporate social investment. It is when a tourism businesses uh, business actually spends uh, money on uh, social projects. That is what is known as a C S I. Then one point four point two. Reusing glass containers for a different purpose. When you reuse um, uh, glass containers for a different uh, purpose, you are actually uh, practicing the environmental pillar. So 1.4.2 is E, which is part of the environmental pillar. You are actually promoting. Um, you are actually promoting the. Um, the planet. So it's part of the environmental uh, pillar. It is part of the environmental pillar. Then moving on to 1.4.3, procurement. Procurement, the word procurement, it simply means buying. So buying of goods from a local community is known as the economic pillar, simply because you're trying to promote local businesses. So the correct answer there is actually B economic 
Tila. Economic, that is the economic pillar. Then moving on to the next one, 1.4.4, the body that satisfies that businesses um, practice the triple bottom line. So that body is actually A. It is actually A, which is also known as fair trade tourism. So the correct letter there, it will be A. The board is known as Fair Trade Tourism, or in short, it is known as uh, FTT. Fair Trade Tourism is the body which ensures that all tourism businesses, or it certifies that tourism businesses apply the triple bottom line, FTT. Then uh, moving on to the next one, 1.4.5. Businesses consider the positive and negative impacts of tourism on local communities, culture, and heritage. So that is actually concerned with the social pillar. That is so concerned with the social pillar. So the correct answer for that one, it will be D, which is the social pillar. That will actually be the social pillar. So those are the correct options, which are uh, appropriate for those questions. Now let's move on to uh, the next question. So we have 1.5. The pictures uh, below show the different forms of payment. Match pictures A to F below to the descriptions numbered 1.5.1 to 1.5.5. Write only the letter next to the question numbers 1.5.1 .1, uh, to 1.5.1 in the answer book. All right, so what we are going to do we are going to start with 1.5.1. 1.5.1, a transaction used to send money or pay goods and services using uh, electronic devices. So the correct answer then is D. If you look at um, uh, D, um, there is use of um, a tablet and there's also another tablet. So the methods which, which is being used here, it is actually called electronic transfer or you can call it e-transfer so that um, electronic transfer is a transaction used to send money or pay for goods and services using electronic devices so the correct letter there will be g now moving on to the next one the best way to pay for small purchases so the keyword there it's small when you're doing small transactions uh, like bottled water from a street vendor you don't need to use a card, but you'd rather opt for uh, cash, which is A. So you'd rather go for A, which is your cash. So the correct answer will be written here. That is A, which is cash. So 1.5.2 is actually 1.5.2. That's actually cash. When you are doing small transactions, it's advisable that you use cash. Then a preloaded multi-currency debit card that is convenient to pay for purchases during um, international um, travel. So the preloaded um, card, it actually ap ap um, appears on the image uh, C. So that is your preloaded um, card. That is um, the one which appears um, here. So 1.5.3. This is 1.5.3. Uh, then moving on to the next one. Money is available after an arrangement was made with the bank to repay the amount in monthly installments. So in that case, we are talking about a credit card. So in this case, our credit card will be uh, F. As you can read, it's written MasterCard Visa credit card. So that is, um, so it will be F. F is our credit card. So we write the option F right next to uh, 1.3.4. So 1.3.5.4 uh, rather is actually a credit card. Then we do have uh, an international bank-to-bank -bank network of electronic transfer transactions using payment orders and codes. So that one is known as SWIFT. It is actually known as SWIFT. That is an international bank-to-bank -bank network of 
electronic transactions using payment orders and codes. So 1.5.5 is actually the letter E. The correct answer for it is the letter E. So we are writing the letter E here. Now let's move on to the next one. The next one is actually a question on map work and top planning. Then it also includes a question on um, foreign exchange. So study the world time zone map and the information below and answer the questions. So the first thing which you need to do, you need to study the time zone map. It is actually important for you to study this time zone map. You need to know how to use uh, even the wheel, which is here, then also the rim, uh, ribbon, which is on top to do the calculations. So we have uh, a scenario there. On uh, the 40, uh, 45th Cape Town cycle tour, the world's biggest timed cycle race in the world was held on Sunday, 12 March 2023. The cycle tour attracted more than 30,000 cyclists from across the globe. This year, the Cape Town Cycle Tour opened opportunities for junior riders of 13 years and older to join the 42-kilometer race. Then the scenario is as follows. Gordon Will is a talented 16-year-old cyclist from London. His parents and his grandmother decided to travel to South Africa to support Gordon's participation in this Cape Town Cycle Tour 2023. The family enjoys adventure-based activities. Gordon and his family took a direct flight from Heathrow International Airport. They departed from London. So we need to highlight some of the key uh, things here, especially things like the time of our departure, which we will use in our calculation. So they departed from London at um, 90, at, um, that's actually seven um, at night or seven in the evening. On which date? On the 8th of um March 2023. So we need to highlight this. Then they arrived in Cape Town on the following day. That is the uh, 9th of March 2023. Then the total flying time was 11 hours. So we'll keep this in mind. We would need this information when we do our next sum. Gordon's grandmother offered to pay for a new bicycle. She insisted that he buy a top of the range bicycle in South Africa. She gave him uh, 3,000 uh, British pounds in, um, in cash, which she exchanged, exchanged for South African rand in Cape Town. So the first um, part of the question is calculate the time difference between London and Cape Town. Calculate the time difference between London and Cape Town. So I'm going to highlight the key, um, the key word here. The question is looking for time difference. So when we are calculating time difference, we need to refer to the time zone map. So I would want to go back to the what to the time zone map. It's unfortunate that it's um it's upside down, but if you go to it to the your time zone map, you can see that um London, London, it is there, it is actually zero, it is actually uh on the zero time zone. Then if we go to Cape Town, our Cape Town will find it here. Cape Town, it's actually part of the plus two time zone. So we are comparing the time difference between zero and plus two. So we do it uh, using our ribbon. We actually do it using our ribbon. We are going to calculate from zero up until we get two plus two. So the first one, one, then two. So the time difference between the two uh, cities is actually two hours. It's actually two hours. And remember, we are moving from east, from uh, west to east. So it simply means that uh, Cape Town is two hours ahead of uh, London. So uh, time difference. Time difference is equals to two hours. The time difference between London and Cape Town is two hours. How did we get it? Uh, Cape Town, uh, okay, we start with Cape Town. Cape Town is um, 
plus two. London is a zero. Then we say two minus zero is equals to two hours. So that's why we say the time difference between London and Cape Town is actually um, two hours. Then 2.1.2, .2, calculate the time, uh, arrival time in Cape Town when Willis uh, flight landed on 9 March um, 2023. So whenever you are calculating arrival time, you say arrival time, we start with the formula, departure time, time plus flight duration. We say fly, uh, departure time um, plus flight duration. So in this case, we are going to take our sum a little bit below here. So we are going to determine our departure time. So our departure time, if you go back to the question, our departure time was um, 1900 hours, or you can call it 7 p.m. 1900, I'm going to write 1900 here. 19. 1900 plus 11 hours of the flight. So we are talking about uh, 19 plus 11 hours of, um, of the flight. So obviously, if you add your 19 plus 11, you are going to get 30 you are going to get 30. Then that 30, you subtract it from 24 hours, knowing that we have 24 hours in a what? In a day. So the arrival time will be 6 a.m. According to um, GMT time, it will be 6 o'clock GMT time. But if you want to change it to South African time, uh, you can actually change it as well to South African time, knowing that uh, Cape Town is two hours ahead. You can say 0600 hours plus two hours equals, so it means in Cape Town, South Africa, it was actually 8 a.m. So um, this is one way of doing it, which is a mathematical uh, way. But normally we discourage our learners from uh, using the mathematical way for obvious reasons. At times you might get uh, lost along the way. You might get um, lost along the way. So we encourage also learners to make use of the time wheel, which appears on your time zone map. All right, you can also use the time wheel. We have been told that the departure took place at uh, 1900 hours. So here is our 19. So we can start counting from 19 and we have also been told that our flight duration is 11 hours. So let's um, start counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. So if you look, it still gives us um, uh, 6 uh, p.m. It's uh, 6 a.m. rather. It still gives us... Um, 6 a.m. Then we also need to take note that we have crossed um, uh, uh, midnight. So it's since it's six, you can say it's um, six o'clock GMT time, or it's actually eight o'clock uh, South African um, time, SAT. So both answers would be what would be correct. Because in the first case, you would have used London time. And in the second scenario, you would have used uh, South African time. But in any case, both options will actually be correct. Both options are actually accepted as correct answers. So moving on to the next one, we do have um, an image which appears there. Refer to the picture below, answer the questions uh, that follow immediately. So if you look at this picture, it is actually showing us an entry point uh, or a point of entry, which is, it can be a border or it can be an, um, an airport. So it's a port of entry. So at the port of entry, you come across two channels, the green channel and the red channel. 
you come across um, two channels. So on this side, we have um, the red channel. Then on the other side, we have um, the blue channel. We have two channels on these two different um, sides. We have the red and the green channel. We have the red and green um, channel. So this is the red channel. Then on the other side, we have uh, the green channel. On the other side, we have um, the green channel. So apart from their luggage, uh, apart from their luggage, Gordon's mother carried um, carried 50 mils of perfume. So let's highlight 50 mils of perfume. I'm going to highlight it in what? In green. It is allowed to carry what? Um, 50 mils of um, perfume. It is actually permissible. Then also one liter of wine. This is allowed as well. So I'm going to highlight it with what? With green. Then and also carried his cycling what? Uh, gear. Cycling gear is part of your personal uh, clothing. It's not meant to be sold in South Africa. So it is allowed. Which gets us to the question. Advise Willis family which channel they need to proceed uh, at Cape Town International Airport. Obviously, when they are at Cape Town International Airport, they need to use the green channel. Why are we saying so? They are carrying goods um, which are allowed. So our correct answer then will be the green channel. They should actually go through the green channel because all the items which they are carrying are actually allowed by um, by SARS or by the South African Revenue uh, Service. All right. Give two reasons. So we are going to write the reasons below that. I'm going to write the reasons uh, below. One liter wine is allowed. Of wine is duty free. It is allowed to carry a liter of wine. Then another reason, so this is the first reason which you are providing. Then I'll also try to provide another reason. I'll try to squeeze in there. Uh, another reason is that uh, 50 mils of uh, perfume allowed. 50 mils of perfume is also duty free. It's allowed. Then personal cycling gear is allowed. Cycling gear is duty free as well. You are not allowed to pay. Uh, you are not required to pay duty for those um, three items. So any of these reasons can actually give you at um, four marks. 50 meter uh, mils of perfume is allowed. Cycling uh, gear is also duty free. It is uh, permissible to carry those items through customs using the green channel. Now let's go to uh, the next question, 2.2.2. The men in the picture are not employees of um, airports company, South Africa, AXA. Name the government body that employs them. So if you look at um, these uh, two um, gentlemen or two officers, rather, they uh, work for the government. So which um, department do they work under? So the correct department then will be the South African Revenue Service. Um, customs, um, you can actually say S A R. Yes. So they are employed as um, customs officers now. So they work for the customs office under the South African Revenue Service. That's the department uh, or the government body which they fall under. So they work under SARS. This is the responsibility of South African Revenue Service to check the goods which enter and which exit a country. All right. Now it brings us to question B, which says, explain two duties. When you talk about duties, we are talking about responsibilities. What are um, the responsibility of SARS? All right. To control, the first responsibility to control the movement of goods. Of goods. into and out of the country. So the responsibility of the South Africa Revenue Service 
is to control uh, the movement of goods into and out of um, the country. Into and out of um, the country. Into and out of the country. So the second responsibility is to, to collect tax or to collect excise duty on behalf of the government. That is this, um, uh, the secondary function, to collect excise duty collect excise duty on behalf of the government of the state or of the government. That is the second responsibility of the South African Revenue Services. Mm -hmm. So when you mention uh, both answers, you would actually be entitled to two marks. The first one to control the movement of goods in and into and out of the country. Then the second one to collect um, excise duty on behalf of the government. All right, the next question uh, would actually require us to read the scenario as well. So we are saying. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question, which is question 2.3. Right, we need to read the scenario first uh, for 2.3. So the scenario reads, the family checked into their hotel in Cape Town. Gordon sent the WhatsApp message below to his friend John in New York. We need to highlight uh, the key words there, which would help us to understand uh, the question. So Gordon sent the WhatsApp message below to his friend in New York at uh, 1400 hours. So we highlight New York, then also the time in South Africa. So this is South African uh, time. Your 1400 hours, this is SA standard time, which you write as SAST. Then um, the message reads, hi, John, we landed safely in Cape Town. It is an amazing city. I'm very excited about my new bike. Looking forward to the Cape Town Cycle Tour. Wish you a year too. So now the question requires us to calculate the time in New York. The time in New York. So what is required of us is the time in um, New York City. The time in New York when Gordon's friend received the message. So um, there's also a note that New York practices GST. So um, in the last part of the calculation, would also include GST. So going back to the question, um, it requires us uh, to first establish the time zone for New York. Then we establish the time difference between New York and uh, South Africa or Cape Town. So if you go back to the time zone map, which appears on the next display, we need to identify Cape Town. So we need to highlight where the city of Cape Town is exactly so the city of cape town appears there then the time zone for cape town appears on top where it is uh, shaded there then going to new york new york appears here this is where new york is in the minus four time uh, zone region so we need to determine the time difference between the two so we start counting using the ribbon or the number line from minus five up to plus two so we would count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there is a seven hour difference. The time zone of South Africa is actually seven hours ahead of um, New York. So let's go back to the sum. So what do we need to do? So we have been given South African time, which is seven hours ahead. So it means we are going to subtract 14. 100 minus 7 hours, 1400 minus 7 hours. Then we go back to our time zone map. The best way of subtracting um, hours is by using the wheel, which appears on the left bottom corner of your time zone map. So we are starting at, um, we are starting at 1400 hours. We're starting at uh, 1400 hours. 
So we identify 14 on the well. This is our 14. Then we count seven hours from 14, going uh, backwards. So we say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it takes us to 7 a.m. It takes us to 7 a.m. So let's go back to our sum. 1400 minus seven hours, it actually gives us seven. So it was actually uh, 7 a.m. When, um, when the call was met. But you need to bear in mind that New York practices DST. So during this time, New York was practicing daylight saving um, time. So we add one hour GST plus one hour of GST. So our final answer will be, it was 8 a.m. when the call was met. It was actually 8 a.m. in New York, uh, New York time when the call was met. So the first thing which you are supposed to do when you're dealing with such a sum, establish the time difference between the two cities, then you add or you subtract depending on which side you are moving from. So in this case, um, we actually subtracted because New York is behind South African time by seven hours. Then we also adjust the time according to daylight uh, saving time. Moving on to the next question, which is 2.4. We have a scenario which appears on 2.4. The Willis uh, family spent five days in um, Cape Town for the cycle tour and to explore the city. Redraw uh, the table in your answer book. Complete the blank spaces uh, for days two and five on the itinerary. The itinerary must include the following one adventure activity. So we are going to highlight this. We must include an adventure activity which they can engage in Cape Town. Then you must also include a shopping event before the cycle tour. So as you can see on our itinerary, day one, it's already uh, filled in. That is the arrival on the 9th of March in Cape Town. But for day two, we need to give them an activity which um, might be adventurous to them since they are arriving in Cape Town. So there are so many things which uh, they can do in Cape Town. For example, in the morning, they can, um, they can go to a, a craft market craft um, market, this is option one. They can go around looking for what, uh, for crafts in the morning, that can be in the morning, or they can go to a local shopping mall in Cape Town, local mall for shopping, that is in the morning. Then later in the day, they can do quite a number of activities. They can actually uh, go on cable car rides, cable, car rides, which are actually adventurous. Or they can actually go hiking. They can actually go hiking on Table Mountain. That is another option which they have. Then we can also do the same thing for, uh, for day five. Day five, day five, they can go shopping for souvenirs. You can actually go shopping for souvenirs. You can actually go shopping for things which will make them, um, which will remind them about their tour in Cape Town. Then in addition to that, they can also go for um, site viewing or sightseeing. Uh, in the Table Mountain Park, in the Table Mountain National Park. You can also go for sites uh, being in the Table Mountain National Park. So there are quite a number of things which um, they can do on those uh, two days. Visiting local craft markets, then they can visit the local mall. They can also go for cable rides. And in addition to that, another option which you have they can go for a boat cruise on the what at the V and A um, waterfront. A boat cruise can be another option. A boat cruise. 
So all these are different uh, options. Now moving on to the next um, page, which is uh, question three, which says refer to the table below and answer the questions that follow. So for this one, you need to be having your, um, your calculator next to um, you. So we do have um, different exchange uh, rates which appear there. We have different exchange uh, rates. So we have the first uh, country is the United Kingdom. Then we have the United States of America. Uh, so the currency code for the UK is GBP, Great British uh, Pound, which, uh, which whose BBR is 2198. Then the bank selling rate is 2218. Uh, so the first question reads, do you think the rand was strong or weak against the two major currencies? So if you look at it, in order for you to get one uh, British pound, you have um, to actually fork out 22, uh, 18 rands. And in order to get the US dollar, it's 1840. Uh, so it, this actually shows us that the rand was weak against the major currency. The rand was, um, was weak against the major currencies. The rand was actually weak against the major currencies. Why are we saying that it's weak? In order for you to get a single unit of the major currencies, you have to pay more South African rand. For example, the pound, you have to pay 22 rands for only a single pound. The same applies to uh, the US dollar. You have to pay $18 to get um, the US dollar. So our reason is you have to pay more to pay more um, more runs to get a single foreign unit. A single foreign. So you have to pay uh, more runs to get a single foreign unit. You have to pay more South African runs just to get a single pound or a US dollar. Then uh, the question reads, explain three possible reasons why Gordon's grandmother insisted that uh, he should buy a bicycle in South Africa. So there are several reasons which you can actually include. All right. Um, you can talk about the exchange rate. The exchange rate makes it more cheaper to buy in South Africa. That's the first reason. It's um, more cheaper to buy in South Africa than bringing a bicycle from um, abroad. The exchange rate makes it more cheaper to buy in South Africa. That is the first um, thing. Then uh, in addition to that, another reason to avoid paying for customs duty. Uh, customs duty. You know very well that um, when you import something from abroad, you have to pay duty for it if it is not included in the uh, duty-free list. So we have two reasons now, but we need a third reason. So another reason, um, for the sake of convenience, you can't move around with a bicycle on an airplane. So for convenience, for convenience, and to save flight, uh, or and also to um, to avoid baggage cost on the airline. Baggage um, costs when you get into an airline, you pay extra for extra luggage. So we have four reasons. Eh? The exchange rate makes it much more cheaper to buy in South Africa. Remember, the rand is actually weak, so it would appear as if South African goods are actually cheaper than. Um, goods bought from outside. Then also to avoid paying customs duty. Then for the sake of convenience, moving around um, with a bicycle on an aeroplane, it's actually inconveniences him. Then to also avoid baggage uh, or luggage uh, cost. Now, um, it brings us to the next question, which is 3.1.3. The money Gordon received from his grandmother, uh, from his grandmother gave him the buying power 
to afford a top of the range uh, uh, bicycle. Explain the concept of buying power. So buying power can be simplified as the ability, ability to buy goods and services and services at a lower cost. Or you can say the ability to buy more goods and services for less. or at a lower cost. That is what we call buying power. So even if you look at um, the scenario involving um, Gordon, you find that in this case, when he was coming to South Africa, he actually had a higher buying power, simply because the currency which he is exchanging for the South African rand is actually much more powerful than the South African rand. So it goes back also to the question of the weekend the strong rand. When the rand is actually weak, it gives inbound tourists a higher buying power. Then um, moving on to the next question, 3.1.4, Gordon's mother gave him um, 3,000 pounds to buy a new vehicle, a new bicycle rather. Calculate the amount uh, Gordon had in rands to buy a new bicycle in South Africa. So in this case, we are actually uh, converting pounds into um, into rands. So we need to determine a formula from forex, which are pounds, from forex to rand. We multiply. We multiply by BBR, which stands for bank buying Right. So when we are moving from forex to runs, we actually multiply using our BBR, which is also known as the bank buying uh, rate. So in this case, we need to determine what we are multiplying with. So from forex to runs, we multiply by BBR. So in this case, we have our three thousand pounds times. Let's go back to the currency table to determine the BBR for, uh, for the pound. So if you go back to the currency table, we are actually going to get um, the bank buying rate. We're actually going to get uh, the bank buying rate, which is 2198. The figure which we are using is 2198. We are using this BBR. Why are we using BBR? The simple reason why we are using BBR is that when you are changing Forex into runs, it's the bank which is buying Forex uh, from you. So that's why we use BBR. The bank will be buying foreign currency from you. So the bank uses what we call BBR. So our BBR in this case is 2198. So I'm going to write it here. So we are multiplying 3000 um, pounds times 21. Nine eight. So if you multiply three thousand pounds times twenty one nine eight, it gives you sixty five thousand nine hundred forty rands and forty rands. So we don't have a uh, sense outside. So our answer will be actually correct to two decimal places. So um, the key thing here is when you are calculating or when you are converting rather from forex uh, to rand you are supposed to multiply by the bank buying rate, simply because the bank is actually buying the currency from you. Then you write your answer, and you also indicate that it is in rands. Now, moving on to the next question. Moving next to the next question, which is um, based on a graph. There is a Forex um, graph, which is indicated there. Study the graph below and answer the questions that follow. It actually shows the fluctuation of the South African rand. So you must know that currencies, they change over time. They don't remain the same. They fluctuate over time. So it shows the fluctuation of the South African rand against the US dollar uh, between January and March 2023. So if you look the first, um, the beginning, it was, um, that is uh, 9 January 
then the last date of the statistics was actually 15 March. So we want to look at the trends of the fluctuation of the South African rand over that period. So the first question reads, the highest exchange rate of the rand against the US dollar. So we need to highlight the key thing, here: the highest exchange rate. When was the uh, South African rand much more valuable against the US dollar? So if you look at, um, at the different dates, on this date, on 9 March, it was on 1720 then, uh, the following day, it was on um, 1680. Uh, so it means on this day, on 14 January, one dollar was costing only 1680. So we are looking at the day when the US dollar was actually cheaper as compared to the South African run. So that day, we are going to highlight it as what it was on 14 January. It was on 14 January. Then one dollar was equal to 16 runs eight. eight. On this day, uh, one dollar was equal to 16 runs eight. So um, that is the day when the South African rand was actually stronger than any other day. The highest exchange rate of the rand. That is the highest exchange rate. Now we want to look at when the South African rand was at its lowest. So if you look back, uh, if you go back to a uh, graph, the South African rand actually fell to its lowest when it hit the 1880 mark. 1880 mark, that day was 15 March. So first I would um, take this uh, figure. So let's go back to... Um, Let's go back to our, the lowest exchange rate of uh, the rand against the US dollar on the date. So it was on 15, the date was actually 15 March, on the 15th of March, one dollar was costing, one US dollar was costing, let's go back to the graph and take uh, the price there. One dollar was costing 1880. One dollar was costing 1880. One dollar would get you, or rather, 18 runs, 80 cents will get you one dollar. 18. Eight. So, um, if you go back, um, um, I'll try to explain uh, the sense um, of this um, again. If you compare the two exchange rates, if you go to 3.2.1 on 14 January, you could actually buy one dollar at 16 runs 80. But on 15 uh, March, the rand actually lost its um, value. One dollar was now costing, was now more expensive. It was now costing 18 rands a year for you to get just a single dollar. So that is um, 3.2.2. Now we need two reasons why the South African rand fell to a new low against the US dollar from mid-February to mid-March 2023. All right, there are quite a number of reasons. The fluctuation of a currency is determined by the things which are taking place in a country. It can be on the political level, it can be on an economic level. So if you look at this time, there was also the issue of load shedding. Load shedding, it actually also have an impact of um, the value of the South African rand. It also causes fluctuation of the South African rand. Besides load shedding, you can also talk about economic data. You know very well that this is the time when uh, the budget uh, speech usually is announced. So when the budget speech um, is announced, it also has an impact uh, on uh, the South African rand. Then we can also talk about uh, protests. There were protests, labor unrest, labor unrest or strikes. This can also affect 
uh, the value of the South African uh, rand. So the prevailing economic conditions or political conditions actually affect the, uh, the value of the South African rand. So all, all of these can be listed as what as reasons why the South African rand was uh, fluctuation, fluctuating rather. Now it brings us to, uh, to question uh, four, which appears on uh, section C. So the title of the term section is actually tourist attractions, culture, heritage, and tourism. So if you look at um, the images which appear there, image A, image B, then we also have image uh, D. So if you look at the images, they actually show the icons which are being studied for the year 2023. So the question now reads, identify the icons or attractions above using the information given below. Write only the name of the icon next to the question numbers. Then we go to A. The aim of the matador is to entertain the crowd. So the icon which is associated with matador is actually icon uh, C. So your A would be um, icon uh, C. Why are we saying icon C? Icon C, actually it represents uh, bullfighting in Spain. This is bullfighting in Spain. So it involves one bull and someone called a matador. So that is actually bullfighting in Spain. So the correct answer for A is uh, C. Then the icon is a symbol of democracy and freedom. So let's uh, relook at our icons again. So if you relook at your icons, we have A as the stage of liberty. So A, that is actually uh, the correct uh, icon which symbolizes uh, freedom and um, democracy. Icon uh, A is the one which is appropriate for the description given in B. Remember, it was a gift um, to the United States of America from France. So, um, sim, um, icon A, icon A, Icon A represents uh, freedom and democracy. So I am going to write uh, the correct letter there, A, which is the statue of um, liberty. Then C, this market in Thailand has food vendors. So we are talking about uh, the floating markets of Thailand or of Bangkok. So it's actually Icon G, Icon G. I think you can see uh, the two vendors who are uh, selling their produce on boards on the floating markets of uh, Thailand. Then this natural formation is uh, layers of red rock. So the icon which is layers of red rock is actually um, the Grand uh, Canyon, which is uh, which appears there. So that is your icon B, which is also known as the Grand uh, Canyon. It's icon B, which matches uh, the description given in D. So we are going to write um, the letter D right next to this description. That is uh, 4.1.1. Now on 4.1.2, two world heritage sites um, included, um, two world heritage sites, obviously, um, the first two, that is your A and B. A and B, they are actually uh, two old heritage sites. So the reason why they must be protected, A, a symbol for democracy, for freedom and democracy. And democracy. Then uh, B, it represents a unique geological formations. Geological formations. So that's why they should be protected. Geological formations. So those are the two reasons why um, those icons must be um, must be 
must be protected. So now we are going to the unique aspect of icon D. Unique as, uh, aspect. All right. Um, the unique aspect about um, the floating markets is that it is the only, the biggest um, uh, floating markets in the world. Markets um, in the world. So it represents the biggest uh, floating markets in the world, in the world, which is actually a unique aspect. Then we also have picture C, which is representative of a controversial. Controversial simply means much uh, debated cultural practice. So discuss um, two reasons why certain people believe that this practice should be. Um, why is it two reasons? Um, discuss two reasons why certain people may believe this practice should be allowed to continue. All right, um, some people believe that um, it um, represents um, uh, the culture of Spain, of Spain. Some people believe that it um, represents the culture of Spain. It attracts several tourists. Several tourists. It actually uh, attracts uh, several tourists. So that's why certain people may believe that these practices should be allowed uh, to continue. Those are some of the reasons. Now, moving on to 4.2, we do have um, an icon which is known as uh, the Marco Pico. It closed indefinitely because of political situations. This famous on uh, tourist site has been indefinitely uh, closed uh, over the ongoing protests in the countries, uh, hundreds of tourists were struck for hours as rail services to the site were damaged. Politically motivated violent protests have endangered the lives of um, tourists and officials, have cautioned tourists against traveling to Marco Pico. So, name the continent and the country where the Marco Pico is located. So, our keyword then will be the continent. We need to identify the continent and also the country where that particular icon is located. So we, um, we would um, identify the country as, the country is known as um, Peru. The country is known as Peru. Then Peru is located in um, South America. Peru is actually located in South America. So the country is Peru and location South America. Then 4.2.2, describe one physical feature that makes um, the Marco Pico um, a popular uh, tourist um, attraction. So the architectural design, design of the citadel. Okay, the arch architectural design of the citadel, it mark actually makes it um, a unique uh, tourist attraction. Then 4.2.3. 4.2.3, the violent protest had a negative impact on the country's tourism industry. Discuss the negative impacts. So um, when you look at the negative impacts which took place uh, after this uh, development, uh, people cancelled their what's uh, there flights, tourists, cancelled flights, flights to Peru. Then um, you can also indicate that um, it actually scared tourists. Uh, you can actually say that um, it um, portrayed Peru in a negative way. Uh, Peru is an unsafe tourist destination unsafe um, tourist destination. People became uh, scared of um, visiting uh, Peru. 
Then in addition to the cancellation, you can say that uh, even hotel bookings were canceled, then trips were postponed. Postponed. Uh, trips were actually postponed to Peru. So that actually affected the tourism industry in Peru. Question uh, five, it says study the information below and answer the questions that follow. So it talks about um, South Africa's fabulous flowers and fynbos. So the World Heritage Site in the picture above is known as the Cape Floral Region. That is actually the Cape Floral uh, Region. That is the Cape uh, Floral Region. I think you can see the flora which um, appears there and also the mountains which appear uh, right below, which shows that is the Cape Floral Region. The World Heritage Site identified in question 5.1 can be classified as a natural site. Remember, we have two uh, classes for World Heritage Site. We have we actually have three. We have the natural sites, we have the man-made sites, then we have mixed. We have the natural, the cultural, and the mixed site. So that one is actually a natural site. So name the province where the World Heritage Site is located. It's located in Western Cape. It is located in the Western Cape. Located in the Western Cape. Name other World Heritage Sites in the province identified. The other World Heritage Site there is Robben Island. It is known as a Robben Island. That is another World Heritage Site located there. Then 5.2, uh, the criterion used was used to, uh, to declare the World Heritage Site as a World Heritage Site. Explain one uh, value of um, the unique uh, uh, Finbos uh, uh, biome in attracting um, tourists. So uh, there are several species, uh, several species of um, of plants found in that region. Uh, found in um, this region. Then there are some unique species. Some um, unique plants only found in that region. Only uh, found in this region. They are not found anywhere else, but only found in this region. So that is what uh, makes it uh, unique. Then um, we have a case study, which is there. A fire destroyed a small part of the edge of the uh, Table Mountain National Park. This is one of the 13 protected area clusters of the natural properties, including in the on the World Heritage List. This region is one of the world's greatest biodiversity hotspots of global significance. In a paragraph, discuss three threats of uncontrolled fires as a result of irresponsible behavior. So uncontrolled fires, they destroy plants, your plants, that's your fauna. They destroy plants, that's your um, flora, sorry. Then they also destroy fauna. They destroy um, fauna, which are referring to animals. Then we can also talk about um, destruction of property. Of property. It can be uh, infrastructure which is surrounding uh, the area. Then in addition to that, uh, loss of life. People can also loss of um, human life. Life. Then you also know that um, it can cause pollution all those uh, things which are associated with uncontrolled uh, fires or irresponsible tourism behavior. Then in addition to that, we look at question six, which says study the image below and answer the questions that follow. Gearing up uh, growth at meetings, Africa 2023. So name the marketing organization responsible for hosting meetings, Africa 2023. The marketing organization is known as SA Tourism. It is responsible for marketing South Africa as a tourist uh, destination. So SA Tourism is the name of the organization. 
identify one type of um, tourist who will be attracted to this event. Obviously, your cultural tourists who are interested um, in discovering um, the cultural heritage of um, South Africa. Cultural tourists can be uh, a suitable option there. Then name the two other international travel trade shows where South Africa is marketed. So the key word then, we are talking about inter international travel uh, trade shows where South Africa is marketed. International. So we have the ITB, which takes place in Berlin, which is known as um, the International Travel uh, Boss. It takes place in Berlin annually. Then we also have another one, which is known as um, um, the WTM which takes place in London, WTM, that is um, the one which takes place in London. Then discuss two ways in which international travel trade shows can position South Africa as a terrorist um, destination choice. So there are several ways in which such um, events can position South Africa as a destination uh, of choice. So they provide a platform to showcase, it is a platform, a platform, um, to showcase what South Africa is to offer. Um, what uh, South Africa, what South Africa is to offer, is to offer as a tourist destination. As a destination. So it for, uh, provides that unique um, platform. Then in addition to that, it allows interaction uh, interaction between um, players in the tourism industry tourism industry it allows um, interaction between tourism in the uh, tourism industry and uh, tourists it actually um, provides that interaction whereby they will be telling them what South Africa has to offer and also other unique um, things um, which you can find after visiting South Africa. So that is uh, question uh, six. Now moving on to the seventh question, which is entitled Tourism Sectors and Sustainable and Responsible Tourism. It requires you to refer to the picture which appears below, and then you will respond to them questions. If you look at uh, the picture, you can actually see that uh, different personnel, they are actually dressed in a very, very professional uh, way. So a uniform contributes to the professional image of an airline. So discuss uh, two ways in which um, the correct manner in which uh, employees where a uniform contributes to the professional image of an airline. All right, so the first thing is that a uniform, if you encounter um, workers who are dressed in a uniform, it actually gives a professional um, outlook in the sense that a uniform, uh, it actually shows a sense of teamwork, of um, teamwork whereby um, colleagues are putting on a uh, similar uniform. It shows a sense of um, um, teamwork. Then it gives a sense of uh, professionalism. It actually shows that people are serious when it comes to their job. It gives a sense of um, professionalism. It actually gives a sense of professionalism. People tend to trust people who are putting on uh, uniform. Then, in addition to that, a uniform also it um, it markets. A uniform also markets the company, the airline. It actually uh, markets their airline. So any of those three options can um, actually show how um, they uh, actually show actually contribute uh, to the professional image. So the staff responsible for the safety of um, the passengers um, on uh, the aircraft, these are known as the cabin crew. These are also known as the cabin uh, cabin uh, crew. 
you can call them the uh, flight attendants as well. These are um, known as uh, cabin crew, or they are also known as flight um, attendants. So the cabin crew of an airline has uh, so many responsibilities. So punctuality, all right, why is uh, punctuality one of their uh, conditions? Give one condition as, as part of the airline's code of conduct on the following. Punctuality, all right, uh, punctuality. Um, crew should be, be punctual to avoid flight delays. They should be on time to avoid uh, flight delays. They should be uh, on time to avoid uh, flight delays. Then in their treatment of passengers, they, um, in their treatment of passengers, they should ensure that um, they should um, never subject, um, they should never subject Passengers to risk. To risks. They shouldn't subject uh, their passengers to different risks. It means exposing them to various uh, dangers. They should not sub uh, subject passengers to risks. Now, moving on to question eight. Uh, read the information below and answer the questions that follow. We have a technology to track uh, sustainability. So there is a new digital system called Weaver, which was created to manage sustainability of the tourism industry. Weaver is an easy to use technology to track environmental and social imports, impacts. Rather, The tourism industry is worth 1.6 million in total and it employs over 270 million people worldwide. The tourism industry has the power to reduce the climate crisis and slow down by this biodiversity loss. Weaver gives accommodation uh, establishments and other tourism sectors, the two to measure their impact on the environment. Give one word for the definition below. Using resources in a way that meets the demands of the current generation and, uh, co and without compromising the needs of the future. So that is actually known as sustainability. That is um, sustainability. That is uh, meeting the demands of the current generation without compromising the needs of the future generation. Then hotel groups uh, reduce their impact on the environment in different ways. Discuss two ways, how can a hotel manage each of the following sustainable uh, practices? Uh, water management, we can actually reduce, um, uh, reduce uh, the use of water through Water through um, uh, through there are several ways of reducing um, through um, the use of um, the use of um, water saving water saving um, perhaps you can say washing machines there are some washing machines which they are designing, which are actually save uh, machines. Then um, even showers, water saving, showers which save water. They can actually use showers which save uh, water. In addition to that, planting of indigenous trees, of um, indigenous trees. They don't need too much indigenous plants. Indigenous plants do not uh, need excessive watering, so they actually save um, energy. Then uh, energy management, the use of solar power, of um, solar power saves energy. Then in addition to that, you can also discuss um, the use of um, of uh, energy saving, saving devices, or even lights. 
it actually saves um, energy. So those are some of the ways which can be used. Then um, the second um, 8.3, discuss um, the positive impacts of tourism on the global economy. Tourism is very important to the global economy. It, um, it, um, uh, it creates millions of jobs, Tourism creates millions of jobs. Then in addition to that, um, it results in the multiply effect. Tourism results in the multiply effect. In addition to that, uh, tourism promotes global global peace and cooperation peace and uh, cooperation then you can also say that um, it promotes cultural exchange uh, tourism promotes uh, cultural promotes cultural exchange. Promotes um, cultural exchange. It also promotes cultural exchange. That is, um, those are some of the benefits. Now on uh, 8.4, the Weaver Digital System was is designed to track environmental and social impacts of tourism business. Suggest two ways in which you would encourage this business to make use of them with a digital system and uh, thereby enjoy the benefits of reduced. So the two ways in which you can um, encourage, um, you can suggest um, uh, training of um, staff, of uh, staff on the use of uh, staff on how to use it. Then um, certification. Of uh, compliant business operators. Of uh, tourism business operators. Uh, of operators. You can uh, uh, provide certification or awards form uh, businesses which are actually uh, compliant with the system. So um, that is another way which you can actually use. Then domestic, uh, regional and uh, international tourism. We do have a case study there, study the information below and answer the questions that follow. The next FIFA World Cup will be held in North America. The soccer federations uh, of USA, Canada and Mexico submitted a joint bid to uh, FIFA to host the competition. The North American traditions named their bid United 2026. 16 cities across the uh, United States of America, Canada, and Mexico will host this prestigious tournament. This is the first time three nations will host the World Cup. They declared that their combined sporting infrastructure will make them the best equipped host for the first uh, 48 tournament, uh, 48 to uh, team tournament ever. So a possible challenge uh, would be the travel documents to allow between the uh, movements between the host countries. A possible solution for this can be a multiple entram entry system. So we have um, Canada, United States of America, and Mexico as being the, what, the worst of them event. Give one reason why the extract refers to a continent, not uh, to a country. All right, um, these, uh, these events uh, or this event will be hosted by three countries on the same continent. This event will be hosted by three countries located on the same continent, on uh, the same continent.
So that's why they are mentioning this. These um, they will be uh, hosted by three countries hosted uh, located on the same continent. So I identified uh, two reasons why uh, this one will be unique. Something which is unique is um, it hasn't been uh, experienced elsewhere. So in this case, we are going to uh, um, identify the unique aspects of this what uh, of this tournament. So there are two aspects here. So the first one, uh, the first one uh, we are going to have. The first unique aspect is that there will be a, a, a forty-eight. The first thing is that the tournament is going to be hosted by what uh, by forty-eight teams. So this is the first thing. The tournament will be hosted by 48 teams. Then in addition to that, um, three countries or three nations. Three nations which are Canada, USA, and Mexico, they will be hosting this thing. So it hasn't been uh, done elsewhere before. So the two unique um, Reasons, I'm going to state them uh, right below. So um, the unique reasons are that the unique um, The two reasons why the 2026 World Cup will be unique is that uh, it will be hosted. It will be hosted um, in three different nations. It will be hosted in three different uh, nations or countries. Then, in addition to that. You can say that um, 48 teams are going to participate. Remember, it's um, traditionally it used to be a 32. 48 uh, teams tournament for the first time. 48 uh, teams are going to participate for the first time. So these are two reasons why uh, this event is going to be unique. So the next question is that, Two reasons why the 2026 FIFA World Cup is considered a global event. It attracts it attracts um, a global audience. It is followed by um, all countries from the world. Remember, this is the biggest um, uh, SOCOM event. So it attracts a global audience. In addition to that, it attracts global media coverage. It attracts uh, global global media coverage so most um, media houses in the world they actually cover this event so that's why it is considered a global event in addition to that um uh, several teams from the world they participate in it several um global participants for example in this case 48 countries are going to participate in this event so no wonder why it's called a global event participants it attracts several uh, people from around the world discuss one positive impact impact of the fifa world cup we have on the economy of uh, north america so obviously uh, new jobs will be created then um, better infrastructure to host the event 
better infrastructure, more tourism, more tourists, more tourists will visit um, the North American continent. Then the concept of the multi-entry visa. All right, it's a visa which allows you you to enter a country several times, different countries, several times. So it's a visa which allows you to enter different countries several times. You can use it to enter Mexico, you can use it to enter the United States of America, then also Canada. Then you can move around those countries at any given time. So that is why it is called a multi-entry visa. Now on 9.2, more visitors to the Kruger National Park. The Kruger National Park has seen an increase in, tourist, in visitor numbers between 2022 and 2023. So we have uh, the United States of America 10.7, then the other one, UK 11.3, Germany 26. Then domestic uh, visitors, the graph is also indicated there. Then now we we'll get um, to the main question. Visitor numbers to the Kruger National Park have not recovered to the pre-COVID-19 levels. Yes, yet in the 2023-2023 peak season, the park only received 93% of visitors compared to 2019. So identify from the graph the core market with the lowest uh, visitors number. So if you go back to the graph, we look at uh, the three core markets. When you talk about core markets, we are talking about the USA, we are talking about uh, the UK and Germany. So obviously, if you go to the United States of America, it has the lowest number there. So our correct answer there for that uh, particular question is the USA. It has the lowest um, international visitors to uh, the Kruger National Park or to South Africa. So the correct answer would be the USA which is tending at 10 point something percent. Then refer to graph B. Discuss why Mpumalanga and Limpopo are considered to be the two of the top provinces for domestic visitors to the Kruger National Park. So if you look at Mpumalanga and Limpopo, these are actually the two provinces which house the Kruger National Park. The Kruger National Park is located in Mpumalanga and in Limpopo. So the reason is that um, the two provinces are the closest provinces to the park. So it's cheaper province to the park. So it's cheaper for travelers from Limpopo and for travelers um, teams from the world, they participate in it. Several um, global participants. For example, in this case, 48 countries are going to participate in this event. So no wonder why it's called a global event. Participants. It attracts several uh, people from around the world. Discuss one positive impact, impact of the FIFA World Cup we have on the economy of uh, North America. So obviously, uh, new jobs will be created. Then um, better infrastructure to host the event. better infrastructure, more tourism, more tourists, more tourists will visit um, the North American continent. Then the concept of the multi-entry visa. All right, it's a visa which allows you you to enter a country several times, different countries, several times. So it's a visa which allows you to enter 
different countries several times. You can use it to enter Mexico. You can use it to enter the United States of America, then also Canada. Then you can move around those countries at any given time. So that is why it is called a multi-entry visa. Now, on 9.2, more visitors to the Kruger National Park. The Kruger National Park has seen an increase in, tour in visitor numbers between 2022 and 2023. So we have uh, the United States of America, 10.7. Then the other one, UK, 11.3, Germany, 26. Then domestic uh, visitors, the graph is also indicated there. Then now we would get um, to the main question. Visitor numbers to the Kruger National Park have not recovered to the pre-COVID-19 levels yes, yet. In the 2023-2023 peak season, the park only received 93% of visitors compared to 2019. So identify from the graph the core market with the lowest uh, visitors number. So if you go back to the graph, we look at uh, the three core markets. When you talk about core markets, we are talking about the USA, we are talking about uh, the UK and Germany. So obviously, if you go to the United States of America, it has the lowest number there. So our correct answer there for that uh, particular question is the USA. It has the lowest um, international visitors to uh, the Kruger National Park or to South Africa. So the correct answer would be the USA, which is tending at 10 point something percent. Then refer to graph B. Discuss one reason why Mpumalanga and Limpopo are considered to be the two of the top provinces for domestic visitors to the Kruger National Park. So if you look at Mpumalang um, and Lipopo, these are actually the two provinces which house the Kruger National Park. The Kruger National Park is located in Mpumalang and in Lipopo. So the reason is that um, the two provinces are the closest provinces to the park. So it's cheaper province to the park. So it's cheaper for travelers from Limpopo and for travelers um, from Pumalanga to go to the park. The two provinces are the closest to the uh, are the closest provinces to the park. So it is cheaper for them to travel there. Then refer to information in C. Give one reason why the recorded visitor numbers are compared to the 2019 season and not the 2021 season. Obviously. Uh, 2019, 2019 represents the peak season, the peak uh, season before before COVID-19. It actually represents uh, the peak season before COVID-19. What do you mean by that? Um, the figures for 2019 and 2021 are not reliable because in 2019, in 2020, or 2021, um, COVID-19 restrictions, there were COVID-19 uh, restrictions limited travel. They actually limited travel uh, between one place uh, to another. The COVID-19 restrictions, they actually limited uh, travel or they limited uh, tourism. So going to, on to the next one, the next question, which is um, actually question 10. So we are going to study the infographic uh, below and answer the questions that follow. An analysis of customer services and experience reflected the things below. To win a customer, is uh, six or seven times more expensive than to keep a current one. Then loyal customers are worth 10 times as much as their first purchase. Then 70% of customers will not purchase again after experiencing poor service. Then it takes 12 positive experiences to make up for a one negative one. Bad service reaches much more than twice as many years as praise for good service. So um, our question now reads, Explain the two reasons why the findings are important for a tourism business. In order to improve
the quality of the service. Of um, service. Then another reason is um, in order to in order to identify the problematic the problematic areas. in order to identify the problematic what, um, areas. And after identifying the problematic areas, uh, business can actually uh, address those problematic uh, areas. Explain the meaning of the finding. It takes off positive experiences to make up one negative one. All right, one negative experience. Experience. Um, is costly to the company, uh, to the business. It is actually uh, costly to the business. It harms the business 12 times. When a business uh, does not treat a customer well, it actually harms uh, the business 12 times. It is very, very costly um, for you to treat customers in a very bad way. It will come back um, to you. Then 10.2, study the cartoon below and answer the questions that fall. Oh, the disappointment. I am disappointed of service. I will not return unless you fix the problem. So I am tired of your poor excuses. State one way in which management could respond appropriately to the customer. So one way, uh, they need to listen. Uh, okay, listen to the customer. Then apologize for bad service. Should listen to the customer to apologize for bad service. Then investigate. The source of origin, you investigate the source, um, the source of the problem. Of the problem. Then address the problem. and compensate and compensate address the problem and compensate then 10.2.2 recommend one strategy a company can use to win back customers um um customers um loyalty so another strategy of um uh winning back customers loyalty is through Addressing shortcomings, uh, shortcomings or weaknesses um, then you might as well compensate uh, for bad service. Uh, when you offer bad service, Compensate uh, for it. You can actually give um, free service to win back the loyalty of the cu um, customer. Compensate for bad service. Then staff also need to be trained. Train staff. To provide good service. must train your staff to be on point when it comes um, to good um, service. So these are some of the strategies which you can actually do. Train your staff, compensate for bad service, where you know that you have done, uh, your staff has uh, provided bad service, 
they can actually uh, be compensated. So as you can see, we have um, attempted to give um, answers for each and every question in the paper. So in a tourism paper, all questions are composed. So you must make sure that all questions are answered and you mustn't leave any question unanswered. All questions are um, answered. Which brings us uh, to the end of uh, this particular discussion of um, the 2023 November Memorandum.